of uh, Dr. Vedekar Memorial Trust and the various institutions, dignitaries and friends. I am really very happy and pleased to be amongst you and to have been invited to deliver this third Dr. V. M. Bedekar Memorial Lecture at Thurle Bajira Peshwe Sabagur. In fact, I am at a loss of words because when I was uh, phoned, uh, you know, I got a telephone call from Dr. Bedekar and then from Dr. Guru Prasad Murthy that uh, will you be delivering this memorial lecture. I thought it was indeed a great honor and also a test for me because delivering a lecture on a topic like this which is which has generated great interest and controversies and where people have really strong opinions and you find that being reflected in the newspapers every day. To share my thoughts on this was indeed a great opportunity and also a test of the erudition of the efforts which I would be taking in it. And I would be failing in my duty if I uh, sort of do not satisfy you. So I have laid out a fair which covers more or less the entire gamut of globalization and its impact on the economy. Before I start on my talk, a few words about Dr. Bedekar. Unfortunately, I did not have the opportunity of personally interacting with late Dr. V. L. Bedekar. But he was an institution par excellence in Thane. I would say he was a living legend of Thane, a really social reformer, a visionary in the field of education. And I must say, because when I was small, I have passed Thane quite often. I used to go to Pune to visit my brother, who lives there. So I have seen after Thane station, I have a distinct recollection that there used to be a mangrove swamp all along. And probably this area was also a part of that. And within a matter of probably 30 or 40 years, if you see outside now at all these institutions, there is a tremendous transformation. And what do you think has brought this about? Because if you look at another place which I had visited long time back and again subsequently recently off and on Dubai, there also you find a tremendous transformation. But there is a difference between the two. The desert there has bloomed into concrete buildings, swanky malls, but all of that was possible because of the oil money. So it's money and commerce, an urge for profit, which has driven this transformation. Whereas here it's the vision of an individual and his entire family, which has not only supported it, but continued it into the future, which has brought about this transformation. Because let me tell you, it's the most difficult thing to do, to start an educational institution in a country like us, which has so many restrictions, so many rules, since I'm aware of the functioning of universities and institutions and closely associated with academics. Let me tell you, for every small thing, you need approvals, accreditations and permissions. In fact, one sometimes wonders, I'm going to touch upon it towards the end, one wonders whether we are really in a globalized and a free economy for education, which is a basic necessity and our right, is itself still so shackled. Can we say that we are today really free? But that is a point to ponder. So to sum up, L greater than or equal to C or learning greater than or equal to the rate of change is something which has been possible only because of the efforts of persons like Dr. V. M. Bedekar. So we should really be thankful that it was because of the seeds sown by him we are in such an institution today. One more point which I wish to make when I was preparing for the lecture and that is what creates the test of everything. I'm fortunate that my guru, Dr. Guru Prasad Murthy is here. He was my PhD guide as he mentioned to you, also my mentor. But he is one person who does not stomach any nonsense or is a very strict taskmaster. So even when I showed him what I am probably going to talk on, a brief outline of it, he said, well, that's not enough. You need to put some more punch, some more quotations, some more uh, sort of uh, 
I would say, some more intellectual rigor into it. And that is what I like about him. It is, he reminds me of P.T. Barnum, of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. When somebody gave a very good act in front of him, he saw that act, he was balancing a bowl of goldfish on his head and an accordion in his hand and was doing 20 things at the same time, juggling balls. He said, can you not make the goldfish do something? So, I am happy that I have a guru like him. So, always trying to bring the best out of me. But before I actually again start my main talk, I would like to share a few thoughts with you in our local language, my alma mater, Marathi. देश, समाज, वंश, धर्म अनेक विभागात बंधनात अपन वाटल गो जगत सगे जी लोकसंख्या है ती असंख्य बंधन वाटली गए जागतिकीकरण मे सग भिंती सपाट करा बर्लिन वॉल जी पड़वली तस कि निदन दिनी उची कमाई कर अशा या जागतिकीकरण अर्थव्यवस्थे पर नक्की परिणाम हो जग की संकल्पना का हाँ मन पहला विचार कि जागतिकीकरण ग्लोबलाइजेशन जग मे नक्की का है। जी स्लाइड है नीट पा वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम द आईज ऑफ अ वर्ल्ड एक किड़ा असे जो जमीनी सरपट चलना है दृष्टि ने हा मानूस मुलगा कि रनर जोर धावत है ते कस दिसेल तो अस दिसेल मे जग है का दुसरी स्लाइड पहा वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम द आईज ऑफ एन इन्सेक्ट मे एक उड़ना कीटक है हाँ उड़ना कीटका डोत जर तला एक शेप दसल गवता चाहिए मे जग है का तीसर वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम द आईज ऑफ अ बी हि मधमाशी है मधमाशी का जग कस दिता है ये तुम्हें पहू शकता विहंगम दृश्य है पक्षी जगाक कसा बढ़त बर्ड्स आय व्यू अपन ज्यादा अजु एक स्लाइड मैं तुम्हारा दाखना है वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम द आईज ऑफ अ फ्रॉक इन द वेल खूब मंडूक वृत्ति अपन ज्यादा एक विरीत बेड़का दृष्टि जग कस पड़त पड़ते जागतिकीकरण सगले जे वेगवे दृष्टिकोन है त्या दृष्टिकोनाचा एक समन्वय म्हणजे तिथे हे सगळे दृष्टिकोन एकत्र येत आहेत आणि सगळ्यांना दुसऱ्याला काय वाटत आहे दुसऱ्याला काय दिसत आहे दुसऱ्याच्या काय संकल्पना आहेत याची कल्पना येते याचा अर्थ असा नाही की बेडकाने लगेच पक्षी व्हायचा आहे दुसऱ्या दिवशी तो म्हणून शक्य नाही पण निदान बेडकाला कल्पना असते की बाहेर असं काहीतरी जग आहे आणि पक्षाला कल्पना असली की वेळीच सुद्धा काही प्राणी राहतात आणि ते असं आयुष्य जगतात तर त्याने मला वाटतं एक फार मोठा चांगला परिणाम होईल आणि जागतिकीकरणाकडे आपण खरोखरी वाटचाल करू शकू दुसरी एक गोष्ट आहे म्हणून या हा जो मी विचार मांडला त्याला महत्व आहे की बेडकाचा पक्षी का होऊ शकत नाही तर मानवाच्या बाबतीत असंच आहे मानवाचा एक स्वभाव धर्म आहे तुम्हाला एक संस्कृत श्लोक सांगतो स्वभाव नोपदेशेन शक्य ते कर्तुम अन्यथा सुतक्तम अपि पानीयम शमयत्ते व पावकम म्हणजे कितीही तुम्ही एखाद्या माणसाचा स्वभाव बदलण्यासाठी त्याला उपदेश केला त्याला वेगवेगळ्या प्रकारे सांगून पाहिलं तरी जो त्याचा स्वाभाविक गुणधर्म आहे तो माणूस शक्यता सोडत नाही उदाहरणार्थ पाणी तुम्ही कितीही गरम केलं तरी त्याने आग विजतेच किंवा आग विजण्याचा पाण्याचा जो गुण गुणधर्म आहे तो तुम्ही ते तापवल्यामुळे नाहीसा होऊ शकत नाही तुम्हाला प्रचलित गोष्ट माहिती जर की जेव्हा एक कोळी नव्हती तिला तिच्या मैत्रिणीकडे ती माळी नव्हती तिच्याकडे जरा गेली तेव्हा रात्री झोप येई ना फार बेचेन झाली होती तेव्हा त्या माळीने ते विचारलं की काय बाबा काय तुला त्रास होतोय का तू झोपू शकत नाही एक तुला मला विनंती करायची म्हणजे काय सांग ना तू माझ्याकडे आलेस पाहुणे म्हणून किंवा तुझी विनंती मान्य आहे मला म्हणजे मला जरा बाहेर ओसरीवर जी टोपली ठेवली आहे ती मिळेल का आता आणायला जरूर आण ती टोपली आत घेऊन येते उशाशी ठेवते आणि शांत झोप लागते तिला का तर तिला त्या माशाच्या वासाचा एवढा सवय झाली फुलांच्या वासात तिला झोप येत नाही जेव्हा ती टोपली डोक्याखाली धरून झोपते ती त्यावेळेस एका सेकंदात तिला गाड झोप लागते 
तेव्हा माणसाचा हा स्वभाव आहे की गुणधर्म सोडायचा नाही हा खूप कठीण आहे आणि जागतिकीकरणात पहिलं पाऊल हेच आहे की इतरांचा दृष्टिकोन समजून घेणं जगात काय चाललं आहे समजून घेणं आणि बदलाकडे आपण एक मनुष्य भीतीने बघतो का तर बदल झाल्यावर काय होईल तुझ्या काय होईल याची आपल्याला कल्पना नसते म्हणून हा एक दृष्टिकोन समोर असणं फार जरुरी आहे अजून एक तुम्हाला तीन स्लाइड दाखवायचे या पहा याच्यात पृथ्वी दिसते तुम्हाला पृथ्वी आहे बरीच मोठी आहे आपल्या मनाने शुक्र लहान आहे मंगळही लहान आहे आणि इतर ग्रह तर अगदीच लहान आहेत या स्लाइड मध्ये दिसतात ते पण पुढची स्लाइड पहा आणि तुम्हाला थोडी अधिक कल्पना आहे आता पृथ्वी कुठे दिसते तुम्हाला एका बारक्या बोटीसारखी दिसते आणि ज्युपिटर हा जो ग्रह आहे म्हणजे गुरु हा किती मोठा आहे पहा पण अजून पुढची स्लाइड यायची ही पहा सूर्याच्या मानाने पृथ्वीचा आकार बघा एका टाचणीच्या टोका एवढा दिसतोय तर आपण या टाचणीच्या टोकावर आहोत आणि याच्या पलीकडच्या स्लाइड मी दाखवल्या नाही कारण माझ्या कॉम्प्युटर स्क्रीन मध्ये आणि या स्क्रीन मध्ये त्या बहुतेक मावणार नाही तर जर का तुम्ही आकाशगंगा बघितली आणि त्याच्या पलीकडची जग पाहिली परंतु आपण विचार करताना काय विचार करतो की हा मी हे माझं घर त्याच्यानंतर अरे माझी गाडी आज आत्ता वाटे त्याच्यानं त्याला एक बारीक टोचा पडला त्याला लगेच मी विचार करणार गाडीला काय झालं अरे मी विचार करा जग केवढं मोठं त्याच्या पलीकडे केवढी विश्व आहे आणि अशी अनेक मानव किंवा अमानवी श्रेण्या कालक्रमाला करत असतील आणि आपण असं म्हणतो की एवढ्याशा या डिजवर पृथ्वीवर सगळ्या लोकांनी एकत्र येणार याला आपण जागतिकीकरण म्हणतो तर मग या सगळ्या विश्वातले नव्हे या सगळ्या वेगवेगळ्या आकाशगंगातले लोक एकत्र आले तिकडचे लोक एकदम तुमच्या समोर येऊन उभे राहिले तर काय होईल मला वाटतं मी तर बेशुद्धच पडेल एकदम समजा बाहेरच्या कोणाला असं पाहिलं किंवा नवे किंवा परलोकातल्या मानावाला तर तेव्हा त्या मानाने आपल्यासारखेच डोळे आहेत आपल्यासारखे हातपा आहेत तेव्हा यांच्याशी आपल्याला चर्चा करायला यांच्या बरोबर काम करायला काही वाईट विशेष वाटू नये हा फरक आहे कातडीच्या रंगात फरक आहे धर्मामध्ये फरक आहे इतर काही बोली चाली या गोष्टीत फरक आहे परंतु हा विचार तुमच्या मनात सत्र आवडे दोन विचार एक जागतिक एक दृष्टिकोन स्वभाव बदलण्याचा प्रयत्न करणं आणि आपण एकंदर विश्वाच्या मानाने कुठे आहोत याचा निदान आपल्याला वर्षात एकदा जरी आठवण झाली तरी मी म्हणेन की आपलं जीवनाच खरंच आपण सार्थक करू शकतो किंवा सहकार सामंजस्य समन्वय आणि स्वाभाविक देवाणघेवाण यावरच जागतिकीकरण आणि त्याचे फायदे अवलंबून आहेत असं मी म्हणू शकेन माझं प्रमुख भाषण मी इंग्रजीतून करणार आहे पण काही घडामोडी काही अनुभव मला आले ते चटकन मी तुमच्या बरोबर ते थोडेसे तुम्हाला सांगणार आहे तीन चारच आहेत अनुभव आहे ज्याला आपण इंग्रजीमध्ये कॅमिओ म्हणतो किंवा एक छोटीशी छबी म्हणतो तसे ते आहे पहिला माझ्या मनात विचार आला जागतिकीकरण म्हटल्यावर कि अशी कल्पना करा एक माणसाला जवळजवळ पन्नास वर्ष कारण सत्तेचाळीस ते एक्क्याण्णव म्हणजे चव्वेचाळीस होतात पण मी पन्नास धरतो पन्नास वर्ष एखाद्या माणसाला अंधार कोठडीत डांबून ठेवलं त्याला हालचाल करायची मुभा नाहीये कोणाबरोबर बोलायची मुभा नाहीये आणि अचानक त्याला बंधमुक्त करून सूर्यप्रकाशात आणून ठेवलं तर त्याचं काय होईल विचार का किंवा एखाद्या तहान मुठ्याने व्याकुळ जवळ एक महिना कारण एक महिन्यापेक्षा मला वाटतो तो जीवन करा कठीण आहे एक महिना उपाशी असा एक मनुष्य असेल आणि त्याच्या समोर तुम्ही एकदम पंचपक्वानांचं ताट ठेवलं तर त्याची काय परिस्थिती होईल विचार करा तर आपण जर का एकोणीसशे एक्क्याण्णव पर्यंतच्या आपल्या देशाचा विचार केला तर आपली परिस्थिती बरीचशी तशीच होती वेगवेगळ्या प्रकारचे नियम वेगवेगळ्या प्रकारचे कर या सगळ्या गोष्टींमध्ये आपल्याला एवढं जपडून ठेवलं गेलेलं होतं की त्यानंतर जागतिकीकरण म्हणजे हे काहीतरी वेगळीच दुनिया आहे असं आपल्याला वाटायला लागेल इतका फरक पडला तेव्हा एक आपण आता जेवणाचा विचार झाला त्या माणसाला एकदम पंचपक्वानांचं जेवण त्यावरून मला सुचलं की जेवणाच्या वेळी आपण एक पूर्वी असा श्लोक म्हणायचो छोटासा श्लोक म्हणा किंवा विनंती करायचो जो जेवायला येईल त्याला की यद रोचते तर ग्राह्य पण त्याचा पुढचा भाग विसरून जातो आपण यद न रोचते तर त्याज्यम 
जेवा जागतिकीकरण हो जागतिकार कुवत वाढली क्षमता वाढली की त्यानंतर मग तुम्ही इतर गोष्टींकडे वळू शकता एक दुसरी गोष्ट मला सांगायची आणि ही फार महत्वाची आहे की महाभारतातली एक छोटीशी गोष्ट आहे द्रोणाचार्यांना आपण सगळे ओळखतो द्रोणाचार्यांचा मुलगा अश्वथ थामा कल्पना करा एकदा असा प्रसंग घडलाय तो महाभारतात लिहिलाय की अश्वथ थामा पांडव पुत्रांबरोबर आणि पांडवांबरोबर आणि कौरवांबरोबर एकदा वनात गेला त्यानंतर तो त्यांच्या जिथे ते राहत होते तिथे पोचला महालामध्ये महालात पोचल्यावर त्यांच्या बरोबर त्याने कालक्रमणा केली संध्याकाळी घरी आल्यावर काय घडलं ताबडतोब त्याने दुधासाठी घट्ट झाला तर हा दुधासाठी घट्ट झाला आहे काय झालं झालं इतकंच की पूर्वी त्याला दुधच मिळत होत परंतु आर्थिक परिस्थितीमुळे किंवा तेव्हा द्रोणाचार्यांकडे गाई नव्हते निर्धन असल्यामुळे त्याची आई पीठ पाण्यात चालवून त्याला दूध म्हणून देत होती जेव्हा आता एक प्रकारचं जागतिकीकरणच आहे कारण जेव्हा अश्वत थांबायला खऱ्या दुधाची चव कळली तेव्हा तो परत आल्यावर म्हणाला आई नाही हे दूध नाही आहे कारण मी दूध आज पिऊन आलो तेव्हा आता आपले जे कोट्यावधी बांधव आहेत ज्यांना जागतिकीकरण म्हणजे काय आणि इतर अनेक गोष्टींची कल्पना नाही ज्या जगात चालू आहेत त्यांची जेव्हा त्यांना चव मिळेल त्यावेळी तुम्ही त्यांची चव आणि त्यांच्या इच्छा आकांक्षा कशा पुरवू शकणार आहात याचा थोडासा आपण विचार करायला हवा आज लहान मुलाला तुम्ही चॉकलेट दाखवलं आणि नंतर त्याला देऊ शकला नाही तर काय त्याची काय अवस्था होईल आणि तुमची काय अवस्था होईल याचा विचार करा तीच अवस्था आज देशापुढे येऊ शकते म्हणून एक जबाबदारीने आपल्याला जागतिकीकरणाकडे पाऊल टाकायला हवं अजून एक गोष्ट मला तुमच्या बरोबर इनफॅक्ट म्हणजे आम्ही सकाळी एक दोन मिनिटं बोलत होतो तेव्हा तो विषय निघालाय या कार्यक्रमाच्या आधी आपल्याकडे नारायण मूर्ती येऊन गेले होते मला त्यांच्याबद्दल अतिशय आदर आहे काय झालं की बंगळूरला जो कार्यक्रम झाला त्यामध्ये राष्ट्रगीत वाजवलं गेलं ते गायलं गेलं नाही त्यामुळे उलट सुलट बरेच मतप्रवाह चालू होते काल मला तुम्ही विजय मुखेंचं नाव ऐकलं असेल त्यांच्याकडून एक ईमेल आला की आम्ही एक निवेदन एक आवे आवाहन काढण्याच्या विचारात आहोत की आता नारायण मूर्तीने माफी मागितली आहे तेव्हा याविषयी अधिक चर्चा करू नये आणि हा विषय इथेच संपवावा तर यावर तुम्ही सही कराल का म्हणून मला कालच ईमेल आला अजून मी त्याचं उत्तर दिलं नाही कारण मी त्याच्यावर विचार करतोय कारण हा बराच लोडेड प्रश्न आहे म्हणजे हे चूक होत की बरोबर यावरही दोन टोकाच्या भूमिका आहेत जे घडलं ते बरोबर का चूक अजून माझ्या मनात याविषयी कोणतेच विचार उत्पन्न नाहीत पण माझ्या मनात एकच गोष्ट आली आणि मी ते तुम्हाला वाचून दाखवणार आहे लेक्चर मध्ये जनरली वाचू नये असं म्हणतात पण हे खरोखर हे वाचनही आहे म्हणून तुम्हाला सांगतो भिकू पारे सेंटेनियल प्रोफेसर इन द सेंटर फॉर द स्टडी ऑफ ग्लोबल गव्हर्नन्स ऍट द लंडन स्कूल ऑफ इकॉनॉमिक्स ते काय म्हणतात ऐका द नेशन स्टेट इज बिंग इरोडेड फ्रॉम विद इन बाय डेव्हल्युशन ऑफ पॉवर टू रिजन अँड इन्क्रीजिंग कल्चरल डायव्हर्सिटी फ्रॉम आउटसाईड लाईक ग्लोबल मार्केट अँड कल्चरल फोर्सेस ग्लोबलायझेशन इज इरोडिंग द नेशन स्टेट काय विचार करण्यासारखा मुद्दा आहे खरोखर की राष्ट्रवाद आणि राष्ट्रीयत्व कारण मी लहान असताना तोपर्यंत म्हणजे एकसष्ट साली माझा जन्म आधीच आहे म्हणजे अठ्ठावन्न सालचा आहे तेव्हा मी या सगळ्यातून गेलेलो की ब्रिटिश राजवट जेव्हा आली 
तेव्हा तो व्यापारी म्हणूनच आले आणि खरोखरी व्यापार उभून करायचा म्हणून त्यांनी पहिल्यांदा व्यापार पेठ उघडली आणि त्यानंतर राजकीय सत्ता त्यांच्या हातात आली तेव्हा कमर्शियल ऍक्टिव्हिटी किंवा व्यापार उद्योग आणि सत्ता राजकीय सत्ता यात फार अंतर नसतं प्रथम ते काय म्हणणार की आम्ही आमचे व्यापार नुकसान होऊ नये त्याला म्हणून आम्ही त्याला प्रोटेक्शन देतोय आम्ही त्याची काळजी घेतोय त्याचं संरक्षण करतोय आणि ते करता करता मग ते प्रत्यक्ष देशच त्यांनी गिळणकृत केला आहे सर्वांना विधीत आहे सगळ्यांना माहिती आहे ते हे अक्षरशः खरोखरी दुविधा उत्पन्न करणारी गोष्ट आहे की राष्ट्रीयत्व आणि ज्याच्यासाठी लोकांनी एवढं रक्त साडलं आणि पन्नास वर्षापूर्वीच जवळ पन्नास छप्पन वर्षापूर्वी आपल्याला स्वातंत्र्य मिळालं मग ते स्वातंत्र्य जागतिकीकरण म्हणून या सगळ्या ज्या वेगवेगळ्या विभागण्या आहेत त्या नाहीशा करून ते स्वातंत्र्य विरून टाकायचं का घालवून टाकायचं का हा एक दुसरा मतप्रवाह खरोखरी आहे आणि त्यामुळे ही गोष्ट इतकी सोपी नाही याच्यात खूप विचार करण्याची गरज आहे आता सगळ्यात शेवटी पुन्हा पोटाचाच विचार करा माणूस पोटासाठी सगळं करत असतो एकीकडे आपली संस्कृती आपल्याला सांगते की वसुदैव कुटुंब काय श्लोक आहे तो अयम निज परो व्यक्ती गणना लघुचे तसा उदार चरिता नाम तू वसुदैव कुटुंब म्हणजे हे माझं हे तुझं असं कोत्या मनोवृत्तीचे लोक विचार करतात जे खरोखरी मोठ्या मनाचे ते म्हणतात की हे विश्वचे माझे घर पण ह्या पातळीला माणूस केव्हा पोचू शकेल कारण दुसऱ्या बाजूला तुम्ही विचार केलं तर संत तुकाराम ते काय म्हणतात आधी पोटोबा मग विठोबा तर ते देवाच्या बाबतीत सुद्धा काय म्हणतात की आधी पोट भरलेलं असेल तरच देवाचा विचार करा मग मी माझ्याकडे आधी कोट्यावधी लोक गरीब रेषेच्या खाली असताना मी एकदम चटकन जागतिकीकरणाचा विचार करू शकतो का हे खरंच एक विचार करण्याची गोष्ट आहे तो म्हणून आज परिस्थिती काय झाली की जागतिकीकरण हे एक सोसाट्याच्या वावटळी सारखं किंवा वाऱ्यासारखं आहे आणि ते येऊन पोचलेलं आहे म्हणजे आपल्या तीरावर असं म्हणू शकू आपण जागतिकीकरणाचा प्रवेश झालेला आहे सोसाट्याचा वारा सुटलाय मग आपण या वाऱ्याकडे पाठ करून उभं राहायचं का हा वारा नाहीच आहे अशी मला कल्पना करून डोळे मिटून घ्यायचे दोन्ही गोष्टीचा उपयोग नाही का तर मला श्लोक फार आवडतात म्हणून तुम्हाला पुन्हा एक श्लोक सांगतो वनानी दहतो वने सखा भवती मारोत सैव दीपनाशाय कृषे कसे असते सौरद म्हणजे काय जेव्हा जंगलात वनवा पेटलेला असतो तेव्हा हाच सोसाट्याचा वारा त्याला मदत करतो परंतु जेव्हा मेणमेणता दिवा किंवा एखादा छोटी फलटी तेवत असते त्यावेळी हाच वारा त्याचा काळ करतो त्या वाऱ्याने ती फणती भिजून जाते तेव्हा कृषे कसे असते सौरद म्हणजे जो मनुष्य दुर्बळ असतो त्याला कोणी मित्र नसतात तेव्हा हा जो सोसायट्याचा वारा आहे त्याला आपल्याला सामोरं जायला पाहिजे आणि आपल्याला त्याच्यासाठी तयारी करायला पाहिजे आर वी प्रिपेअर फॉर ग्लोबलायझेशन दॅट इज वॉट वी टू लुक फॉर आपल्याला जागतिकीकरणाला सामोरं जाण्यासाठी अत्यंत तयारी करणं जरुरीच आहे एवढं बोलून आता मी माझं इंग्रजी भाषण सुरू करतो the world is on a high on a roll it is on economic expansion what has happened is it is a fortunate situation that we have a high growth rate no major setbacks interest rates spreads are in limits throughout the world regional problems are isolated if you realize a few years back when there was a crisis in the asian market the entire world was shaken but today when there was a crisis in ukraine there was a many crisis in china nothing went wrong markets bounced back within a few days if not a few weeks so the world is a better place today the world economy all the economies in the world are growing at a reasonably good pace india's future also looks bright because we are marching forward we have a strong economic growth 7 to 10 percent various estimates abound we have a vibrant dynamic and multifaceted economy there are shortcomings in terms of infrastructure in terms of power 
in terms of balanced regional development, but situation seems to be under control. So do you think that given this scenario, we could be the next economic superpower? And will that be the effect of globalization? That, we, that is what we are here to look at today. Today's lecture will be divided into five parts. First, I will quickly plot the past and the present state of the Indian economy. Then look at what are the sources of globalization. Then trace its impact. Look at how to deal with it and how to prepare ourselves for it. And then try and predict the shape of things to come. An economy is known by the production of its goods and services, by the distribution of goods and services, by exchange and consumption. That is creating goods and services and consuming them. This is the economic cycle and an economic activity is normally measured by that. You have economies growing from the agrarian economy of the past where you had barter, that is exchange of goods for goods and there was no money involved. So there were limitations on exchange to an industrial economy which was evinced in the industrial revolution where you had a situation the advent of what we know today as multinationals, companies which started in one place, which produced goods in one place, say the UK, and which sold them throughout the world through their satellite agencies or concerns or depots. So you had industrial economy. And today you have knowledge economy where what is being traded or sold more is the knowledge rather than physical goods because physical goods can be produced anywhere. What is required is the know-how, what is required is the knowledge to understand, produce and apply things. So what are the key issues post-globalization? Global economies in national economics of isolationism are out. Ecology and sustainability, that is sustainable growth, is what is important, not financial return or ROI. Global public good is what is looked upon today, not prosperity and wealth of nations, Eka Adam Smith. Social and human capital is relevant, not tangible fiscal capital. So today, it is not the temples of modern India which Jawaharlal Nehru had talked about, the factories, the glistening factories, but what is more important is the people who man those factories. That is, the people who actually think about them, dream about them, ideate them and create them. People who do research, people who teach, all of those who are involved in economic activity. So, a behavioral change is coming upon us, a cultural change is coming upon us. Now, what are the measures which we are going to look at in order to judge the impact on the economy? Consumer confidence and spending, if you really look at it, Consumer confidence and spending has never been so high. Five days back there was a news report in the Economic Times that the Indian globe traveller spends a very huge amount of 7.5 billion US dollars a year compared to the Chinese which is 11.4. But 7.5 billion dollars is a very very large amount. So you will understand that consumer confidence and spending has really become very high. Exchange rate is strong and so that is again an economic measure which shows that we are meeting up to the whole world. In fact, on PPP basis, our GDP, GNP, all these rank us fourth just after USA, China and Japan. Interest rates are stable though going up a bit. National debt is a cause of concern but can be easily controlled. And finally, a rate of return a small issue here, small issue because we don't count our natural wealth as a part of our balance sheet. In fact, none of the countries today, except probably Canada, has a balance sheet. So if you look at it, all corporates are balance sheets, but no countries have balance sheets. So we really don't know what are our assets and our liabilities to really judge the rate of return. But this is the rate of return which I am talking of, of industry, and that is very good and heartening. So what is our context? Long back, 5,000 years back, some people even put it at 10,000 years back, we had the Indus Valley Civilization, we had the Indus Strip, 
India contributed to two major religions in the world, Hinduism and Buddhism. It is very significant. I was discussing with Dr. Murthy. Suddenly struck me that China is mostly Buddhist. So we have already exported to them a way of life. So probably eventually we can even export better things and more things to them. So this is the most difficult thing to export, a way of life. You can give, I and mean, these are always sell things, but not how to think. And that is probably what we have exported to the whole world. Arthashastra, Statecraft and Economic Policy, it's a document and a treatise on that, that was given by us. So is the science or discipline of yoga, chess, martial arts, Kama Sutra, Kant's atomism on which the atomic theory is based, Aryabhata's vision Aditya, the list is endless actually, the first university in the world, that was important for me and that's why I mentioned it here, Takshashila. Zero decimal number system, Bhaskaracharya, astronomy, Charak and Shushrut with their contributions in medicine and surgery. So you will find that we were on top of the world then, as it was known. And even in money terms, in the first century we contributed to 32.9% of the world GDP. In 1000 AD it was 28.9% of the world GDP. In 1700, around Akbar's time, Shivaji, after that Shivaji's time, it was 24.45% of the world GDP. And what happened in 1952? We were 3.8% of world GDP. But that was because of the characteristics of the British rule. What happened during the British rule? We were faced with social, political, economic isolation and wilderness. If you are aware, the weavers in Dhaka, Oh, they used to weave the finest muslin which, you, which could pass through a small ring. We are all aware of that. And what happened was, their fingers were cut by the Britishers so that they could no longer produce that and the looms in Manchester will continue humming. So, what was called manzar part, very ordinary kind of cloth, that was being made in those looms. And no one would buy manzar part if muslin was available. So, what did they do? They cut their fingers. Today it is done in a subtle and more different way. Today probably they will buy all the manzar part which they can make. So you will still have to buy the, sorry, rather they will buy all the muslin which you can make. So you will still have to buy and use the manzar part. Because what you will say is, it is a globalized economy. So I will sell it to the person who gives me the best price. Keep looking for this in the newspaper. If you read two days back, Times of India, a major story about agricultural produce marketing. There was a reform in APMC. Now, uh, companies can buy farm produce directly from the farmers. And so they had given a picture of a Mandi in Rajasthan. They said, last one month since the season has started, but a single truck has rolled into the Mandi to sell wheat. Nobody is selling wheat in the government APMC market because why the rate given there is 850 rupees a quintal. But what is the other news? The other news is that 24 kilometers away, all the trucks are going into the ITC sort of enclosure, going into the uh, Cargill enclosure and going into the enclosure of Australian Wheat Producers Association. And mind you, why are they buying that wheat? They are buying the wheat because they are offering the market price, which is higher, and so everyone is going there. That's globalization. But they are going to buy the wheat to eventually sell it in the Indian market. Something very significant which we need to look at. But that is what happened during the British rule, social, political, economic, isolation and wilderness. Exploitation of natural resources which were taken away from us forcibly. A stagnated, isolated economy on the brink of ruin. Famine, malnutrition, you even had plague during their time and intense suffering was the order of the day. Now what happened in post-independence era, 47 to 80? Mixed dualistic model where you had public sector, private sector partnership and sort of a coexistence of the two. License Raj, bureaucracy, quotas and controls. I'm, I'm rushing through this a bit because the main juice lies ahead. And a vexatious tax regime where I remember during Moraji Desai's time, the total of all taxes exceeded 100%. If you included CDS, that is compulsory deposit scheme, wealth tax, gift tax and estate duty, probably it went well past 200. But the estate duty was a whopping 85% above 1 lakh. In short, if you had money above 1 lakh, 
you were not supposed to pass it on to your children. 85 percent of that would be taken away by the government. That was the rule of the day. So everything else, which I might, I mean, I, I might have my own opinions about uh, VP Singh, but that was one good thing which he did. He was the one who abolished estate duty. So there will be many people who would thank him now, although we have long forgotten what he had done and it was a great service. Because that gives us an incentive to work and continue to earn a living. 80 to 91 marked an uh, attempt to break free, but it was not enough. It was not enough because there were restrictions and controls, quota regimes in place, license raj in place. So therefore, even though the economy was trying to grow naturally, it was not able to. So the real departure of the turning point came in 91. We were faced in a situation in June where the foreign exchange reserves were less than three weeks supply of oil. Now when that happened, UK was the first country as usual again to say that we do not believe that you will be able to meet your international commitments. So to prove our solvency, like the farmers have to take the gold to the money lender to show him that look I have money, please give me some more credit or wait. We had to ship gold to the UK to prove our credit worthiness. World Bank rushed forward with a rescue package. There was a devaluation of the rupee, not once but twice. But this also led to dismantling of controls. So we have this nice slide where the cage is broken and the bird has flown free. So you had liberalization which came upon us. Now, what is the characteristic of the current period? the so-called privatized, liberalized, globalized economy which we are looking at. We have a free economy, we have freedom of choice of whether to buy Indian goods or foreign goods. You can see it on the road. See, moment you go in a shop, you can find Indian goods, chicken, jalwits, imported stuff. Now, in fact, this word imported has gone. The concept of smuggling has gone. You find that all these things have great interest for us a few years back and they are always in the news. Now you find, I mean if you do a quick search of the newspaper, you will not find the word smuggle or smuggling in it at all. If you look at the last, say, two years newspaper. So you will find the rules of the game have changed, the thing has changed totally. All of it because of liberalization and privatization. But then what impact does it have on globalization? The impact is that we were fortunate to have liberalization and privatization coming at a point of time when globalization touched our shores. It was only because of this that the initial adverse impact of globalization got nullified and we got the best of both worlds. See what had happened is we were never given an opportunity to interact so we were already so repressed that we were tuned to face competition from our own people, from the government itself. They were preventing us. You cannot teach more than 40 people. You cannot teach more than 60 people. I think that is what they tell you when they give you a license, saying that here is a management institute. If I can teach 120, I am used to stop me. But no, they say you have got an authority only to teach 60 people. This is much more difficult to face than another institute which is functioning next door. Because there, there is a fair play of competition. So we were in fact happy that globalization has happened and liberalization has taken place. Because at least we can do whatever we want. We have the freedom of choice and therefore we would probably fight, not exactly fight, but healthily compete with the international and multinational forces once we were liberalized and privatized. I have a case study on that which I will deal with a bit later. But first let us now look at what is globalization. You already seen it in Marathi. It is a set of processes that are widening, deepening and accelerating the interconnectedness among societies. That is what Kegley and Raymond say. Processes whereby societal, social relations acquire relatively distance-less or borderless qualities so that human lives are increasingly played out in the world as a single place. Technological, political, economic and cultural dimensions that connect individuals, governments and forms across national borders. Globalization as deep territorialization. That is a breakdown of borders of space and time. Looks very complex, but three thoughts are expressed in this. First thought, that barriers to flow of information, people and money are now dismantled or substantially lower. That is, people can migrate from one place to the other very easily now. That is the first thing, first effect of globalization. So you could have a 
Philip Mono working next to you in your office. That's a change which has happened. The second thing which has happened is that there is a free flow of communication, interaction, thought, ideas, technology. The third thing is <coughs> capital. Capital is now allowed to be invested anywhere. You could probably, if you feel that the situation here is not so right, you could like Ajanta locate your watch factory in China rather than continuing to have it somewhere near Baroda. So you have a choice of locating wherever you want, of investing, of transferring money wherever you want. So these borders are reduced. What then still remains? What still remains is the baggage which we are carrying. The baggage is cultural, it is social, political. All these views do exist and they keep coming up time and again, not just in India but in the US. I'll give you a very concrete example. The one where there was a big UN cry about how many H1B visas are to be issued. The second one was an equally strong UN cry about banning the outsourcing of government jobs of two organizations to India. But I'm happy about both of those. You would say, why am I happy? Because that now gives us a right to also be selective about globalization. It is the US which always claims to be the sort of keeper of the conscience of the modern world or sort of somebody who shows the path. I and mean, that is the role which they like to portray. Although I'm not sure whether the rest of the world feels that way. If they can ban outsourcing to India by a legislation, by a majority in their Senate, then probably we can also do anything as long as it has a mandate of democracy. If the people want it, it will happen. If the people don't want it, it won't happen. Okay. Now, what are the factors which have really resulted in globalization being thrust upon us, I would, or I would say being pushed upon us? These are push factors. One is technology changes, changes in information and communication. So, the ICT revolution, a convergence where you know media, which is television and films a very powerful medium which connects with people. Combined with information technology and combined with intellectual sort of activities and it actually created some kind of a mix which created a convergence of technologies <coughs> where digital technologies now drive everything. We have the World Wide Web. We have improved transportation where air transportation is continually falling in cost compared to surface transport. So you have now air cargo rates very competitive to surface transport and you have globalized supply chains. So you no longer have a situation where you need to depend on your local supplier. You can always get the best material from wherever in the world if you really are interested in going ahead and doing it. There are cool factors also. It is not entirely thrust upon us. People since 1946 tried to develop international standards, global standards in manufacturing, production, supply, service industry. You had the ISO standards, you had the good manufacturing practices, you had HACCP, you had so many standards. What was all this attempt? People were trying to make things uniform. See, globalization has come at the right time, but there was a lot of hard work which has gone before that. How do you think is it possible that a laptop which is manufactured in China works here? Who told them what is the size of the plug and how does it ensure that everyone makes the same kind of plug? Everyone makes the same kind of connectivity? Everyone keeps the communication on the same frequency? How has that been possible? Just imagine thousands of manufacturing units across the world produce various parts which go into this laptop or this system and you could probably buying things from different companies but all of them are made to a uniform standard so they interconnect and interplay. All this plug and play of devices has been possible only because of global standards and these were created because people felt that there has to be greater collaboration. With world bodies like GATT, WTO, IMF and World Bank. Now, some people say that we have managed to globalize despite them, but they also had a great part to play in 
pushing us towards globalization. You also have this concept of global interaction and exchange. What happened suddenly was people realized that rather than sitting in your own backyard, it is always better to go out and connect. Once people started going, they realized that you get a fresh outlook. I mean, that is my personal experience. I'll just share it with you a moment. Whenever I go out of town, you know, whether it's even by road to Pune or it is on a flight to Calcutta or it is somewhere abroad, suddenly I get this feeling of liberation. I forget my office, my work and my worries back home here and then suddenly thoughts keep coming into my mind. In fact, some of the best writing which I have done or the most intelligent sort of thoughts which I have come, although I assure you they are not that intelligent compared to the August audience here, but whatever thoughts I get, they really come to me when I am travelling out. I don't know why it happens, probably there must be a psychological, sociological or some kind of explanation to it. But it really does happen when you are going out, when you are going to a new place, you suddenly feel expansive. And one more thing which has happened is I have encountered it in Dubai, in London also. Suddenly if you find anyone from a subcontinent, he connects with you very well, then he will forget which nation he belongs to. He will be your best friend as long as he is there. And suppose you are sharing a flight, moment the flight touches down, snap, something happens and the connection is all gone. So that's what people realized and they said let us globalize because when we are globalized, we are connected in a better way. When we meet or when we are here, probably it doesn't happen. So the best way, and in fact, there's one more thing which has happened. As far as my PhD is concerned, it was probably a globalized PhD because he was in Dubai when I was here and Practically 90% of my PhD happened that way and I assure you we were able to meet more often than if you would have been here. So I was meeting you more often than, than when both of us are in India. So it's a point. Now what are the levels of globalization? The first era 1850 to 1914 was the industrial revolution. I will put to you these three periods and the era in a slightly different way. I will put it to you in the words of the IBM present chief, he described multinationals of three kinds. The first kind, he says, is those which were during the industrial revolution, 1850 to 1914. The model was simple. You had a major company which produced everything and satellite offices the world over, branch offices where you sold stuff. So everything was done in the head office, there were only extensions and arms. The second stage of globalization was, according to him, when companies spawned mini companies, mini replicas of their own. So if you had a Pfizer abroad, you had smaller Pfizers everywhere, including in India. 